Good morning. So I associate black boxes with what one finds after a plane crash. So I found this question in the black box. Uh, it's about the, what I was saying about the Trinity and the economy and the ontology of the Trinity, the distinction between God as he is in himself and the God as he is towards us in his grace. And the question is, um, can there be some false moves? You know, do we have to watch out when we go back and forth, as it were, between the economy and the way God is in himself? And specifically, should we be able to say as Christians that God is eternally missional in his being? I didn't get to sleep till 1 a.m. last night <laughs> on this one. Is God eternally missional in his being? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I want to say, first of all, that we have to remember the creator-creature distinction. Whenever we're moving from the way God is to us and the way God is to himself, the first thing we have to remember in the doctrine of God is that God is entirely unlike us in one respect. He is the creator, we are the creature. All the categories we use to describe creatures, they really don't apply to God. So we have to remember that ultimate distinction even as we talk about the way he's related to us. I think the way that Trinitarian theologians try to preserve the creator-creature distinction is with another distinction between processions and missions. In himself, Father, Son, and Spirit have lively relationships. That's in himself. But the mission towards us did not have to be the, the missions correspond to the way God is in himself, but I think the key thing is God was under no obligation to be a missionary God. That's the mystery of grace, that though he did not have to, though there was no obligation, even of his own nature, in his own freedom, he decided to be a missionary God. And so, as I was saying yesterday, he communicated what he is to us. He shared his life. God was not obliged to share his life with us. So in that sense, um, I don't know that I want to say that God is eternally missional if it means he was necessarily missional. Do you see my problem here? On the other hand, it's tricky because God in eternity, before the foundation of the world, predestined us. And so he had the mission in mind, as it were, eternally. But I think I, I do think it's important to distinguish the processions that make God who he is, and then the missions that are outside God's proper being. These are, because the mission is the work of God. It's the work of God. So let's not confuse the being of God with the work of God, but on the other hand, they're closely related because what God does corresponds to who he is. That was the first part of this question. <laughs> the second part is, still on the missional theme, uh, in what way does the nature of God's being form the nature of the church as a missional community? Again, a good question. Uh, I wouldn't want to start my thinking about ecclesiology, however, from the being of God. Um, the, church, the, the church is elected by God, and so that's how I connect the church to God. God elected the church, chose this people to be his holy nation. And so he gave them a mission. He appointed them a, a mission. But I think it's uh, the church is missional. And by the way, that's an important term because it means the church doesn't simply have missions as if it were, you know, one of the things the church might be. The church is missional in the sense that Jesus commissions it. We, we have a commission as a church. And our commission, I think, is to participate in the Son's mission. We're following him. But we don't participate in it by repeating it exactly. Although, you know, every Good Friday there are people who try to participate in Christ's missions, the Pentateuch, by ritually restaging the crucifixion. I think that's a, that's a misunderstanding of how we're to participate because... We don't need to do that again. It's been done for us. Our participation is witnessing to the accomplished work of Christ and its future consummation. I think that's the mission of the church. We see that even in the Lord's Supper. 
where when we celebrate it, we're proclaiming the Lord's death, accomplishment, until he comes, consummation. I think the Lord's Supper encapsulates the mission of the church, proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. And the last thing to say, uh, the mission of the church is, again, intimately tied up with, with Christ and who he is, his mission, but with this big difference. Uh, the church is uh, a parable of the kingdom of God. We live out foretastes of the kingdom. Jesus established the kingdom. Nothing we do can establish the kingdom. And that we shouldn't try as a church to think, oh, our job is to bring the kingdom of God to earth. That's not our task. We're not able to do that. Christ has already done that. Our task is to sing and celebrate and enact that was something he's already done. I think I'm going on for too long. I've got a big lecture here. <laughs> but uh, thank you for the question. Okay. In my previous lecture, I argued that retrieving by grace alone attunes us to the way in which the triune God shares his own light, life, and love with us in Christ through the Spirit. And I was saying that mere Protestant exegetes and theologians don't simply bring their own natural powers to bear when they interpret scripture, but we're participants in an economy of grace. So we can't lay the blame for secularization at the reformer's doorstep, I think. Sola gratia rebuts the charge that the reformers naturalized biblical interpretation. That was the point of examining Luther's contrast between a theology of glory and the theology and hermeneutics of the cross. But returning now to examine the charge that the Reformation unintentionally begat skepticism, a crisis in knowledge, knowing. So this is going to talk about epistemology, the definition of knowing, methods of knowing, criteria for knowing. And in particular, I want to look at Richard Popkin's charge that Luther came up with a new criterion for knowledge, namely, that which conscience is compelled to believe on reading scripture. That which conscience is compelled to believe on reading scripture. Conscience. Well, mere Protestant Christians need to do more than always let conscience be their guide. Scripture is sufficient, and that's going to be my next lecture, but I don't think we can say as much for this Jiminy Cricket approach to hermeneutics. Let conscience be your guide. What is, then, the role of faith in biblical interpretation, and how does it relate to the dictates of conscience? Does faith sanctify subjectivity? Is that what Luther meant? Or does faith give us access to a special kind of objectivity? Or does faith open up a, a, a realm of intersubjectivity? What's the role of faith in coming to know Christ through his word? And how does faith alone compensate for the loss of an external authority? Because this is what Popkin says Luther did. He rejected the external authority of the church magisterium. And my, isn't that comfortable and convenient to have a go-to place to get a definitive answer, the church magisterium? But in rejecting that, says Popkins, Luther uh, opened up this realm of subjectivity. Let your conscience be your guide. <laughs> so with this question, too, Graham Goldsworthy, in his short but important treatment of the solas in gospel-centered hermeneutics, identifies what's at stake. He says, the principle of faith alone points us to the ontological inability of the sinner and the epistemological priority of the Holy Spirit. Ontological inability of the sinner, what he has in mind is the idea that, that we can't make ourselves right through our own works. We're just not able to do that as sinners. And then we'll talk about what he means by the epistemological priority of the spirit and what follows. So uh, again, in my outline, we're going to first look at what the reformers said about the subject. Then I'll 
skip over for the sake of time some alternative positions, and then focus on my constructive retrieval, and then sum it up with some theses. That's going to be the <laughs> fourfold structure of these lectures. So going to the Reformation then, the basic insight here is uh, Luther's recovery of Paul's idea that the just and the justified shall live by faith. Faith alone, not faith in works. This idea that we're justified by faith alone, not by what we do, is rightly called the article by which the church stands or falls. I hope you could all defend that proposition. And it goes back to what I was saying yesterday about Luther's critique of religion. Religion is the attempt to make yourself acceptable to God. And that leads to the theology of glory and over self-reliance. Reform and Luther tried that, didn't work. So this article is the article by which the church stands or falls because it secures grace. It recognizes that salvation is a gift of God. Now there's been a lot of ferment over the doctrine of justification by faith of late. And this is not going to be the place uh, where I engage those debates, for example, about the new perspective. Been there, done that. <laughs> I'm not doing it here. I'm on to a different issue. I'm interested in faith as the means by which believers personally appropriate the benefits of Christ's work. Faith is the way we lay hold of Christ. Faith is the way that everything that Christ is and has done becomes ours. And Calvin says, faith is the principal work of the Holy Spirit. The principal work, the most important thing the Spirit does is create faith in us, he says. And then Calvin goes on to define faith in terms of knowledge. He defines faith as a firm and certain knowledge of God's benevolence towards us, founded upon the truth of the freely given promise in Christ. a promise both revealed to our minds and sealed upon our hearts through the Holy Spirit. It's a great definition of faith. Uh, a firm and certain knowledge of God's benevolence towards us, founded upon the truth of the freely given promise in Christ, revealed to our minds and sealed upon our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Point is, faith does not derive from us. There's nothing we can do to create this faith. It's not simply credulity. That is, a, it's not, certainly not gullibility. It's rather a response to something we've heard. This is important. You see, you can't muster up enough faith to get justified. It has to be a response to a specific word. That's why Calvin relates it to the knowledge of the truth of God's promise in Christ. Faith is a response to a word. It's a response to the gospel. And it's prompted then by word and spirit. As we read in Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So the spirit uses our hearing of the word of Christ to engender faith. We can have faith in other things, I suppose, or we can, have, we can believe in other things, but faith in Christ, this ability to lay hold of Christ, is spirit-given. So sola fide has to do with coming to know by hearing words. Coming to know by hearing words. Is hearing a work? Is hearing active or passive? Yes, <laughs> but it's fascinating. So what I'm going to try to think about here is an epistemology, a way of coming to know that privileges hearing, which is interesting because in our modern world, what of which five of our senses is privileged as far as knowledge goes? It, it, seeing. You know, the Enlightenment's all about seeing through the light of reason and theoria, you know, to behold with your reasoned powers. We're going to be looking at an epistemology that privileges hearing. Uh, 
And not just any word, but one specific word. So point two. In his uh, classic textbook, Protestant Biblical Interpretation, Bernard Ram sets out what he calls the Protestant system of hermeneutics. It's a really interesting textbook. It's gone through three editions. But the longest section by far, apart from his survey of history, the history of interpretation, the longest section by far in the Protestant system, 60 pages, is on philology. Philology, which he defines as uh, the total program of understanding literature. Everything you need to do to become literate. Bringing all the grammatical historical procedures char characteristic of good scholarship to bear on scripture with the aim of discovering its original meaning. Now Luther was a philologist. And like the Renaissance humanists, he returned ad fontes to the sources, the original languages, and tried to understand them. It was actually thanks to Erasmus' critical edition of the Greek New Testament that Luther discovered that the original meaning, uh, that the original Greek, rather, dikaiao, uh, to declare righteous in Romans 3.28, had been translated in the Vulgate with the Latin verb justificare, to make righteous. One might argue, then, that philology is the reason there was a Reformation. It's how, he, how Luther came to his material principle. Well, so we're, we're looking at epistemology, we're looking at hearing, we're trying to examine what the reformers believed about authority as well. And in a book on the reformers' view about authority, a scholar named Rupert Davies uh, grants that Luther treats scripture as, a, as the standard, an objective standard, with which to test our listening, our human interpretations. But Davies thinks that Luther's attempt to make scripture a stable authority, an objective standard, failed. He says, and here, here's why he thinks Luther failed. He says, the majority of Christians must either say that in theory they submit themselves to the word of God, but that as they do not clearly know what the word says, they can only make provisional decisions, or they must submit to the word of God as interpreted by someone more learned than themselves. Do you see what he's getting at here? Is it enough to say that scripture is the standard no, because we have to interpret it. Then the question is, are we trusting our own interpretation or somebody else's? And that choice of having to trust our own interpretation or somebody else's introduces a note of subjectivity into this whole question of authority that Rupert Davies thinks Luther never dealt with adequately. So how might mere Protestant Christians reply to the charge that subjectivity or the principle of private judgment is the very essence of Protestantism. Because that's what a lot of the critics come back to, that private judgment is the essence of Protestantism and that it, that it has loosed anarchy upon the world. By the way, when I was doing a mission in France, I remember being in a town square and handing out Gospels of John, and this is in France, yeah, in French, and so um, someone came up to me and realized I was a Protestant, and he called me an anarchist, and uh, I had a number of emotions that went through. I said, that's cool, but uh, <laughs> then I said, that's, that's totally wrong, and then I realized he was a Roman Catholic, and he had been indoctrinated into this idea, all Protestants are anarchists because they do not have a clear criterion of authority. And Luther indeed appealed to his own reading of scripture. And he did it against institutional traditions. And once the Reformation got underway, Luther had to contend with people who challenged his interpretation of scripture. Uh, his opponents called his interpretations opinions. That must have hurt. For example, Zwingli agreed with Luther that the Bible was authoritative, clear, and self-interpreting but he disagreed with Luther over how to interpret Jesus' words, this is my body. The question was not simply whether Luther or Zwingli was right, it was 
whether the emerging Protestant movement had the wherewithal to resolve such questions. Is there no authoritative balm in Gilead? Enter the Holy Spirit, stage height. We're discussing sola fide, and for Calvin, as I've said, faith is the principal work of the Holy Spirit. So how or might an appeal to the Holy Spirit redeem the principle of private judgment? How might that work? Back to Bernard Ram's uh, book, he says, the Holy Spirit speaking in the scriptures is the principle of authority for the Christian church. That's a little bit different than simply saying the text. He's saying the Holy Spirit speaking in the scriptures is the principle of authority for the Christian church. And Ram actually contrasts that definition with what he calls the abbreviated Protestant principle of authority, which he associates with William Chillingworth's famous comment, the Bible, I say the Bible only, is the religion of Protestants. Now, that's the abbreviated Protestant principle, says Ram, because though it correctly identifies the external principle of authority, it doesn't say anything about the internal principle, the testimony of the Holy Spirit. And Ram wrote an excellent book on the testimony of the Holy Spirit. Does Calvin's notion of the testimony of the, of the uh, Holy Spirit help us here? Well, even that stops short of answering our question because for Calvin, the main function of the Spirit was to assure us that the Bible was the Word of God, to convict us that we were reading God's Word. It wasn't really intended to function by Calvin to tell us which of the many interpretations on offer is the correct one. Now, another book uh, by a Yale theologian, Catherine Tanner, helpfully sets out a spectrum of positions on this issue of how we should understand the Spirit's illumining work. At one end of the spectrum uh, are those who stress the immediacy of the Spirit's work in human subjectivity. The Spirit showed me would be an example of that. Anne Hutchinson, whom I mentioned in my first lecture, would be an example of this end of the spectrum. It's a claim to self-evident divine validation that's very difficult for someone else to refute. If you try to refute the claim that the Spirit showed me, you quickly get into a schoolyard dispute. Did not, did so, did not. But to claim such divine inspiration for one's interpretation, makes, it, makes, it risks using the spirit as a kind of hermeneutical trump card. And appealing to an experience of the spirit also is a kind of indirect attack on the authority of all other communally and socially forms of intellectual, religious, and moral achievement that, uh, or insight that take their uh, rise over a long period. You know, communities sometimes wrestle with texts, and an immediate appeal to the Spirit seems to say that all that is extraneous. So direct appeals to the Spirit's authority are shortcuts that lead back to another kind of abbreviated Protestant principle, where the Spirit ultimately eclipses word. That's the one end of the spectrum. On the other end are those who emphasize the Spirit's mediate work. Not immediate, but mediate work. That is, the Spirit is guiding patiently and in many ways the church into the truth. And the Spirit's authority is at work through other means. So on this view, of, or this end of the spectrum, one has to discern for the Spirit. It's not an immediate claim that one makes. One has to discern the Spirit's work in the messiness of human history. And we're told, of course, in 1 John, to test the Spirits, to see whether they are from God. But more positively stated, this end of the spectrum would argue that reason and conversation and philology and so forth are the means the Spirit uses to guide us into all truth. So I'm raising this question because we have to ask, if sola fide 
emphasizes the role of the Spirit in helping us come to know, should we locate the Spirit's work in individuals' conscience or in the, community, the community's discernment process or both or somewhere else? In this lecture, I'm trying to get the principle of authority right, and then in the next lecture, Sola Scriptura, we're going to be looking more at what I call the pattern of authority, because the principle isn't, isn't uh, alone. Okay, uh, point B, the other views. What, what lies behind the reformers' confidence that they were hearing the gospel correctly? The answer I'm suggesting is the spirit working with the philological principle so that they were able to hear the gospel in their reading. But uh, before we expand on all that, I need to look at some other options for how the church has related faith, philology, and understanding. I won't say much about medieval allegorizing, except simply that uh, in the medieval approach, faith and the spirit were the means for us to grasp a supra-literal meaning, the mystery of Christ behind every literal sense. And the reformers thought that that just opened up uh, a Pandora's box of its own. How do you put a check on an allegorical reading? Uh, so I'm skipping over this for the sake of time. Number two, though, I will discuss a little bit modern historical criticism, because in the 20th century, an unlikely figure recovered sola fide in a surprising way, Rudolf Bultmann. Rudolf Bultmann retrieved sola fide, not to perceive the mystery hidden in history the way an allegorizer might, but rather to demystify history as a demythologizer might. And that's what he was. But Bultmann claimed to have inherited Luther's mantle, Luther's exegetical mantle. He says this. See what you make of this. This is Bultmann. Demythologizing is a task parallel to that performed by Paul and Luther. The radical application of the doctrine of justification by faith to the sphere of knowledge. Uh, what's he doing here? What's he doing? He's saying that, like the doctrine of justification by faith, his method of reading scripture, demythologizing, destroys every longing for security. Maybe one of his students will help you see what he's getting at. Gerhard Ebeling went further, and he argued that the historical critical method is the hermeneutical counterpart of sola fide, and therefore a distinctly Protestant form of biblical interpretation because Protestants who espouse historical criticism make themselves vulnerable to the possibility that the, what the biblical authors have said will challenge their inherited beliefs. I'm not sure if you see the connection there, but this is a 20th century attempt to appropriate sola fide. I'm not going there, but I just wanted to put it on the record. Then more recently, point three, other theologians appeal to sola fide, uh, not in support of historical criticism, but post-liberal pragmatism. Again, remember our question, if interpreters can't achieve objectivity through philology alone, what stops the slide into interpretive relativism? This answer, number three, says faith community traditions. Because we're not autonomous individuals, say post-liberals, we're traditioned individuals. We're members of communities that shape the way we see, think, and talk about things. So this is called post-liberalism because it rejects the autonomy of modern liberal individualism. And it's pragmatist because what bears authority is not reason but community practice. We make our way in the world, says one post-liberal, on the basis of a know-how. There's that epistemological term, a know-how based 
on or acquired through practice. We're trained in community to cope with the world. Uh, so for example, one learns the meaning of strange words like googly sledging or devil's number by participating in the game of cricket, either by playing it or watching it with someone who understands. But I, I have no idea about what I just said. Uh, the, the problem is, if our grasp of meaning and truth and our sense of what makes for a good interpretation depends upon the faith community to which we happen to belong, then for all intents and purposes, what has authority, what conditions our hearing is that faith community. It's highly ironic then that today we have Protestants appealing to sola fide to support this idea of an authoritative interpretive community. Isn't that what Luther was trying to get away from? And the real problem with giving too much authority to the interpretive community is, how do you correct it? How can you correct it? How can you stand outside it? If it is the standard of rationality, how can you stand outside it to correct it? On this view, number three, uh, the Reformation wouldn't have been possible. Okay, let's move on to see then the more constructive retrieval. Notice what I'm highlighting, through faith alone, listening to authoritative words. In order to respond to the charge that the Reformation loosed interpretive skepticism upon the world, I want to focus on the principle of interpretive authority that's part and parcel of mere Protestant Christianity. We need to ask three questions. What is authority? How is it related to rationality? And what role does it play in the process of interpretation? So, first, the principle of authority. And as you know, authority gets little respect, and I'm told even less in Australia. But to pick on my own country, a 2014 Gallup poll showed that the American public faith in Congress had reached a historic low. Apparently just 6% of Americans approve of the job Congress is doing, which is apparently lows, lower than their faith in those who kill, uh, sell used cars. <laughs> People resent authority when it's felt to be an oppressive power that impinges on them from the outside. So uh, authoritarian means a kind of top-down coercive force. Uh, this is the pathological face of authority. But a biblical theological analysis of authority sees things differently. The authority principle in Christianity is the triune God in verbal communicative action. The triune God in verbal communicative action. Authority is rightful say-so. Rightful say-so, the power to commend belief and command obedience. Now I mentioned verbal because authority must involve some kind of saying. Authority doesn't get off the ground unless there's something to respond to. There's nothing to believe or obey unless something is said. God has rightful say-so because he's the maker of all. In other words, divine authority is grounded in divine authorship. Who else has the right to say so than the author of all things, visible and invisible? Romans 13.1, there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Interesting. So there's no authority, but there are some that he has instituted. Now, in the beginning, God instituted the created order through words. Let there be light. Let the earth sprout vegetation. Well, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, says the psalmist. And the Lord is the authority because he's the originator of all. He originated, started the game. Now, without rules, certain activities aren't possible. We couldn't play chess if there were no rules. The same is true of any other game, any other institution, like marriage. It wouldn't exist without some kind of order, without some kind of rules. So authority, rightful say so, rightful rule, is not a coercive force. 
It's an enabling condition of free play. It enables things to happen. Far from constraining human freedom, it's a necessary condition for human flourishing. In other words, according to scripture, authority is not something negative. It's not a punishment for Adam's fall. It's part of God's good created order. It's an enabling condition for freedom's flourishing. And in the New Testament, biblical authority is still positive because it orients freedom to the new reality that is in Christ. There's nothing more frustrating than trying to live against the created grain of reality. It's like beating your head against a wall. But authority orients us to reality along the created and recreated grain. Think again of the chess game. The rules of chess are precisely what make the game susceptible so, to so many fascinating variations. It's been said that chess is war, but I say unto you, chess is authorized action, regulated freedom. And if you know how to play, it's pretty fun. Authorization is the key term. Again, listen to Romans 13.1. There's no authority except for God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. The Greek for instituted, tasso, means to appoint or assign to a position. This means that all true authorities, all authorizing agencies, are divinely appointed to an office. It's a good thing. It's part of the created order. It's not a negative thing. To have authority is to exercise an office and to do so because someone has authorized you to exercise that office. So we're looking for the authorized version. Not the KJV, <laughs> but the authorized version for interpretation. Is there such a thing as an office for biblical interpretation? Well, there is. We're going to be looking at that on uh, Thursday. It's called the royal priesthood of all believers. But the Bible introduces authority early on. God instituted Adam and Eve as ruled rulers, charging them to have dominion over everything in the sea and in the air and on land. He appointed human beings as his vice regents. And it has been said by a theologian that the most basic office all of us have is to bear the divine image. We are all authorized to image God. That's our task. And Adam and Eve were authorized as well. Um, they were authorized to exercise a kind of dominion over a particular domain for a particular duration of time. So think about it. The primary purpose of authority is to provide persons with what is needed to help the world and others to flourish. In an interesting book on authority called Up With Authority, uh, Victor Lee Austin asks us to imagine a, an impeccable symphony, that is a sinless symphony. And he asks, would an orchestra made up only of saints need authority? And the answer is, of course, even a sinless symphony needs a conductor, someone to stand over them or in front of them and to conduct their society, to tell them how fast to go and how loud to play. The point is, it isn't that he's exercising a law, this is interpretation. The conductor's task is to interpret, and there are many legitimate options, but somebody has to make a decision. The point is, to give the conductor authority is to make this society flourish. So again, we're trying to put authority in positive terms. What took Eve captive was a false picture of freedom and a false picture of authority. You will be like God, said the serpent. But this claim was not ordered to reality, and it was not authorized. It was a lie, and falsehood always fails to deliver. There is no true freedom outside divine authority. That is the point. Outside divine authority, there's autonomy, and the wages of autonomy is death. 
So Adam and Eve were, strictly speaking, heretics in the original Greek sense, heresis, of choosing for oneself, because that's what autonomy is. To pick and choose which words of God we'll pay attention to and which ones we'll ignore is to deprive those words of authority. Now, the problem for us today, as the sociologist Peter Berger has described it, is that we live in a world characterized by a pluralization, a hyper-pluralization of interpretive traditions so that picking and choosing is imperative. It, all, it seems as though we all have to pick and choose. And so he actually called his book The Heretical Imperative, suggesting that we in this 21st century world are all heretics in the sense that we all have to pick and choose without an authoritative criterion. But we do have an authoritative criterion. Let's move on to point B. We have Jesus Christ. Listen to Christ's stunning claim. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Matthew 28, 18. Remember, God is the only one who has authority, but he can institute it in others. And it's been given to Christ, everything. Jesus sums up in his person, not only the office of Adam, he is the image of God, right? So he, he performs his office perfectly. But he also sums up in his person other offices, prophet, priest, and king, offices by which God administered his covenant with Israel and had provided that nation with a structure of authority. Now, you'll remember in Israel that when people received an office, God's spirit often came upon them. They were anointed so that they could fulfill that office well. But with Jesus, the spirit came upon him at his conception. So he was uniquely qualified uniquely authorized to perform all his offices. Jesus' authority is distinct then because no other officer before him, no prophet, priest, or king could have said, l'état c'est moi, the way Jesus could. That is the state, it's me. I am the kingdom of God. The Father authorized the Son to instantiate the kingdom on earth. That's what Jesus is authorized to do, to be and to bring, and to establish the kingdom of God on earth. So, um, let's move on to B then. Jesus does not simply keep all his authority to himself, however, he delegates it. Now, it's very unfortunate when some theologians pit Jesus' authority against biblical authority. But I've had many discussions where this has been the issue. P.T. Forsyth, for example, locates authority not in the Bible, but in the gospel. And he actually alludes to Chillingworth's phrase and sort of turns it against him when he says, the gospel and the gospel alone is the religion of Protestants. That is not, not the whole Bible. Ram, Bernard Ram, may have had Forsyth in mind when he wrote the difficulties of a single principle of authority rather than a pattern of authority appear most clearly in discussions of the authority of Christ. Frequently, the authority of Christ and the authority of scriptures are opposed. And this is deeply to be regretted. Sola Scriptura and Solus Christus belong together. The Gospels show Jesus delegating his authority to others, the apostles. He gives them the authority to do the kinds of things he was doing, uh, heal diseases, uh, Proclaim the kingdom of God. He appointed 12. They're his commissioned officers, the ones sent, with a purpose and with authority. And he particularly sends them to preach the kingdom of God. And he not only appoints, but he anoints them as well with the Holy Spirit, which fully empowers them for their office to be Jesus' witnesses. The Spirit will guide them into all truth, for the Spirit, quote, John 16, 13, will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. There's a pattern of authority here. So Jesus sends his apostles to teach others to observe what Jesus had commanded them. They are his appointed spokesmen, his delegated authorities. They are, let's call them, 
the authorized interpreters of Jesus' person and work. There are authorized interpreters. And this is what we mean by apostolicity. It's one of the four traditional marks of the church, along with oneness, holiness, and Catholicity. And it means that if you want to be a genuine Christian, your church has to be in line with the apostles. Now, how we come back to faith comes by hearing the gospel, because the gospel has been set forth in speech by Christ's inspired, authorized, apostolic <laughs> witnesses. Apostles means one sent by Christ. That's their mission, to transmit the gospel. They were not the authors of a new teaching. They simply witnessed and reported or handed on what they had received from Jesus. And Soren Kierkegaard is absolutely right to distinguish the genius from the apostle. The genius, we think of geniuses and we think about epistemology, but they discover what they know through their reason. And Kierkegaard says the only thing that makes a person a genius is that they get to the answer first. But an apostle knows what he knows because he has been told. And if you're told something, even if you're a genius, you won't, you won't be able to know it, that is, unless you're told certain things. Okay, so what we need to ask now is uh, how we have access to what the apostles said. The traditional Roman Catholic answer is to appeal to apostolic succession. Uh, we know that we have the apostolic interpretation if we're in a church that has somehow uh, kept the unbroken line of succession alive all the way back to the original uh, apostles. We call it thoroughbred apostolicity. And at the other extreme, uh, some people would say we, we know what the apostles said if we listen to the experts, if we listen to the scholars, because we live in an age of specialization, and many people associate authority with expert knowledge. And we have experts out there in the university, people who claim to know. So does, does superior knowledge, for example, of ancient Near Eastern archaeology and mythology, does expert knowledge authorize you to interpret the inter Old Testament? Interesting questions. And then a third option as far as our access to the apostles, is fundamentalism. Fundamentalists uh, bow the knee neither to pope nor to scholar. They emphasize the Bible alone, as read by fundamentalist leaders. They don't say it like that exactly, but this is the concern that Ram uh, and others like James Barr have. They worry that fundamentalists mask their presuppositional tracks. The leaders say the Bible says, but then what you might hear is their, their own interpretation of what the Bible says. There's a scholar named Kathleen Boone who wrote a book, The Bible Tells Them So, and she describes fundamentalism as a community tradition that authorizes its own interpretations only to then identify those interpretations with scripture. She says, the pastors are not seen as authorities in their own right, they're simply conduits of the text. The danger, of course, is you open up the possibility of conflating your reading with God's word. And I mention this because it's not a danger for fundamentalists only. I think it's a danger for all of us. The, called the will to interpretive power. We all have that uh, tendency. But in fundamentalism in particular, there's a kind of blind spot to the fact that they are interpreting. Mere Protestant Christians know that they're interpreters and thus they're willing to be corrected by others. Okay, um, epistemic self-reliance. In Ephesians 5, 6, Paul says, let no one deceive you with empty words. That's good advice, but taken out of context, some might use this warning as a justification for systematic doubt. Let no one deceive you. That's become the mantra of some people who need to see everything for themselves. People who are so afraid of being taken in that they take nothing on trust. Is Paul recommending a policy whereby we systematically doubt everything we're said? 
Megenata. The context of Paul's caution about being deceived, I don't think is a general epistemological maxim. It's in context, it's a warning to the Ephesians not to be influenced by the surrounding pagan culture that's characterized by sexual immorality. But what about Luther? Is there something about mere Protestant Christians that predisposes them to be epistemological lone rangers, always protesting and never coming to tradition? It helps to distinguish epistemic autonomy from epistemic responsibility. Epistemic simply has to mean, means it's the adjective that has to do with knowledge. And I'm borrowing here from a book by Linda Zagzebski called Epistemic Authority, a Theory of Trust, Authority, and Autonomy in Belief. She introduces the figure of the extreme epistemic egoist, a person who refuses to take anything on authority. It's just good to have that category in mind. We all know them, perhaps. But when you refuse to take anything on authority, you simply redirect trust to yourself, autonomy. That's a dubious prospect for anyone that has a doctrine of sin and who knows oneself. Zegzebski says that individuals have a responsibility to be epistemically conscientious. Uh, so remember we talked about Luther listening to his conscience. She's now saying we need to be epistemically conscientious. What does that mean? It means that if we're epistemically conscientious, we will use our faculties to the best of our abilities in order to get to the truth. We'll be as good a listener as possible, for example. But she also draws this moral from it. And again, we're talking about people trying to be responsible as knowers. And she says, if I am conscientious, I will come to believe that other normal, mature humans have the same desire for truth and the same capacities that I have. Now, unless I succumb to extreme epistemic egoism, the idea that I am epistemologically holier than thou, uh, there's no reason to think that other readers of scripture are being less conscientious in their interpretations of the Bible than I am. In other words, it's irrational, less than epistemically conscientious, to trust your own faculties and not those of others. It's an interesting argument. Paul says, this is point C, Paul says, that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him. There's no shame, you see, in accepting what you're told. In fact, our trust in others is fundamental to our knowing anything. And this is in sharp contrast to many modern thinkers who say we need sufficient reason or evidence before we can rightly believe testimony. But if we did suspend belief until we verified personally what others told us or experienced it for ourselves, we would know almost nothing. Believing what we're told is as important a source of knowledge as our perception and memory. Thomas Reed, uh, 18th century philosopher, said, God designed the human mind to accept what memory tells us, what our senses tell us, and what others tell us, unless we have good reason to believe otherwise. Modern skeptics say a belief is guilty until proven innocent. Reed says a belief should be considered innocent until proven guilty. It's a matter of whether you want to have distrust or trust as your default mood towards the world and others. Okay, here's the point about trusting others. The authority of a person's testimony is justified by my conscientious judgment that I'm more likely to satisfy my desire to get true beliefs and avoid false beliefs if I believe what the authority tells me than if I try to figure out what to believe myself. In other words, there's a good reason to trust what others tell us. Of course, the real question is, which others? Well, I'm talking about the apostles. I want us to trust the apostles. Then whose interpretation of the apostles? 
At this point, you might be wondering about 1 John 2.27. The anointing of the Holy Spirit that you receive from Christ abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. That sounds like we're back to the right of private judgment. But in context, I think it's about the threat from Gnostics who claim to have access to secret traditions about Jesus. In other words, I don't think in context John is giving his reader a blanket assurance that the gift of the Holy Spirit makes us into infallible interpreters. He's rather encouraging them to abide in what they have heard from the beginning from others. Uh, that's what Paul says, too, in Ephesians 4, 20, 21. That is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him. Paul is assuming his readers learned Christ in the community of his followers. But the, the phrase to learn Christ is peculiar. Nowhere else in the Greek New Testament or even extra-biblical literature of the time do we have the phrase to learn a person. And as far as that last phrase, we're taught in him, F.F. F. Bruce thinks that to be taught in Christ means being taught in the context of the Christian fellowship. All right, um, the next point then, interpretive authority and fiduciary frameworks. Fiduciary pertains to fide. It has to do with, with trust. And Michael Polanyi, a philosopher of science, says that all knowing in science and in theology begins with what he calls fiduciary frameworks, a framework that we have initially to take on trust, and then it will yield a harvest of understanding. If Polanyi is right, then theology is no worse off than modern science. Everyone has to have a faith in something to get the process of knowing off the ground. I'm suggesting the Bible should be the Christian's primary fiduciary framework, the source and norm of all knowledge and wisdom, and that it's trustworthy and authoritative because it's authored by the one who authored all things. It's our fiduciary framework, and it evokes faith, right? Reading this word is how faith comes to be and to be nurtured. I'm suggesting that the church is a secondary fiduciary framework, but it's, this is um, not secondary in the sense of alongside it, but rather that we best come to scripture in the context of the church. Polanyi goes on to say that scientists learn from other scientists like apprentices. And he says this, and this is very relevant to my topic. He says, to learn by example is to submit to authority. So that has uh, some implication for us. And who are our examples? That's the key question. Who do we want to learn from? I want to suggest that we should be learning from the apostles. I want to suggest that we should be apprentices to the apostles and to their canonical practices, their ways of thinking about God and talking about Christ. As Calvin says, the scripture are our spectacles of faith, but we need to be apprentices. We need to learn how to look through them, and we do that by coming to know the apostles' testimony. And then thirdly, church tradition is a kind of tertiary fiduciary framework um, that nurtures us in particular ways of being apprenticed. I'll talk more about tradition next time because I'll, I'll want to give tradition a place in the pattern of authority, but everything is going to depend on what the pattern looks like. Where does it belong? That's the hard question. Okay, so D, let's make some conclusions here. I began by examining the charge that the reformers unintentionally paved the way for modern skepticism because they refused the external authority of the church, the magisterium, and allegedly preferred their own private judgment. But I think if we retrieve sola fide, we'll come to a very different conclusion. Um, my first thesis, though, simply reviews the authority principle that I think we've identified. The authority principle of mere Protestant Christianity is the say-so of the triune God, a speak-acting, <laughs> 
that authorizes the created order and authors the scriptures, diverse testimonies that make known the created order as it has come to be and to be restored in, through, and for Jesus Christ. Obviously, that needs to be exegeted. I don't have time to do that here. Let's move on to the second thesis, though. As persons created in God's image and destined to be conformed to the image of God's Son, mere Protestant biblical interpreters believe that the Spirit both summons them to attend and authorizes them to respond to the voice of the triune God speaking in the scriptures to present Christ. And what's happening here is that through trusting this word, the Spirit makes Christ dwell in our hearts. This is Ephesians 3.17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That doesn't mean we're trapped in subjectivity. The Spirit's witness uses apostolic testimony, and there's testimony of many witnesses, so it's not just one. Um, but in faith, informed by the word, and framed by spirit-guided tradition, we're able to confess what is in Christ. And that confessing what is in Christ, that is our office as citizens of the gospel. I'll be talking more about that, I think, on Thursday. But the point is we're authorized to speak. We're commissioned to speak. And we have a, a certain authority to speak as well, to confess what is in Christ. Third, mere Protestant biblical interpreters believe that they will have a better understanding of what God is saying in Scripture by attending to the work of other interpreters and communities of interpreters as well as their own. Well, do you? It's, well, maybe we can talk about that afterwards. I'm claiming that if you're a mere Protestant Christian, you will. <sighs> Philology, the love of biblical language and literature, is part and parcel of mere Protestant Christianity, but we mustn't ignore the internal witness of the Spirit because God has joined Word and Spirit together. If we only tried to get the meaning of the text through biblical study, through methods that we impose on the text, that might be just one more variation on justification by works, scholarly works. On the other hand, it's just as misguided to appeal only to the Holy Spirit as an interpretive shortcut, like a get out of hermeneutical jail free card. But faith alone was never meant to encourage epistemic egoism. Sola fide neither blesses nor confers the right of private judgment. Faith is the means by which the Spirit unites persons to Christ, and because God has created us social beings who learn from others, faith involves trusting in the words of others, especially apostolic others. And it's eminently rational to do so. Epistemically conscientious biblical interpreters will be open to learning what others have understood God to say, especially when the others in question are those whom the Spirit has also united to Christ. Saints, maybe, or not scholars. Then fourthly, mere Protestant Christians believe that faith enables a way of interpreting Scripture that refuses both absolute certainty, the idols of the ivory tower, and relativistic skepticism, idols of the maze, the cultural maze. In Ephesians 3.12, Paul speaks of Christ in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. I think it's right that we do as individuals indwell fiduciary frameworks. We belong to some interpretive community or another, whether we define it broadly, the community of women, or narrowly, uh, an academic approach like the Tübingen School. But many of us inhabit more than one interpretive community at the same time. We may belong to professional society, a social class, a denomination, and a gender. But no matter what one's location, I think there are two temptations that beset every interpreter and interpretive community. 
On the one hand, the temptation to think too highly of one's particular reading, and that leads to interpretive pride. But on the other, to think too little of one's particular reading, and that leads to interpretive sloth. Pride in the assured results of critical reason is the besetting temptation of modern biblical scholarship. Sloth, by contrast, is the besetting temptation for postmodern interpreters to the extent that their attention is more focused on exposing the situatedness of readers than it is on the text itself. And I think pride and sloth are the two ends of the spectrum of the seven deadly sins. And all sin is a denial of reality. It's a denial of the created order and a refusal of the creator's word that structures it. So in different ways, both pride and sloth are denials of our creaturehood. One denies our finitude, that's pride, doesn't recognize our limits. The other, uh, sloth, denies our responsibility. Pride and sloth are two ways of denying God's authoritative word, insofar as they refuse in their different ways to accept our divinely authorized status as interpretive agents. God designed us to be people who could hear and respond to his word and to other persons. So, uh, justification by faith is not a license for either complacency nor despair. It's God's reauthorizing us to image him as ruled rulers, to speak and act as citizens of his kingdom. And I think biblical interpretation is best undertaken in the context of a community of the justified, the church, where individuals learn from one another how to become virtuous interpreters, displaying not things like pride and sloth, but the virtues of interpretation, of which the chief virtue is humility. In interpretation, as in all areas of the Christian life, we have to counter pride with humility, or proper confidence, as Paul calls it, and sloth with due diligence. So sola fide is the answer to skeptics, because faith yields knowledge, but it isn't a work. Faith yields knowledge, but it isn't a work. It's proper confidence and patient attentiveness. What do we know that we have not received? So faith is not private judgment then, but public trust. Trust in others, trust in God's people as authorized by Christ to convey his word to us. We'll be looking at that word tomorrow then under the heading of Sola Scriptura. Thank you. While we give Professor Van Hooser a moment uh, to uh, prepare himself, uh, we have uh, a brief period of time for questions. Uh, a microphone will be handed around uh, to uh, ensure that we don't have to repeat the question. Uh, I would invite you, though, to slim down the preamble for your question <laughs> before asking it. But uh, if you're ready, sir, we'll take questions now. Yes, in the centre here. Slim it down. My question is, was the omission of the Holy Spirit from the solas considered and deliberate or accidental? So, as far as you know, <laughs> uh, do we lack a solar Holy yeah. Spirit uh, by accident or by design? Hmm. Well, the, the five were not formed by the reformers themselves to begin with, and... As, in, as is so often the case, what people say is determined by the context, and they're trying to offer correction. So in the first instance, sola gratia, sola fide, sola scriptura, they're corrections. And, what, and when they say scripture alone, they mean and not tradition, and faith alone, and not works. So I don't know that there was an, as obvious an error that would have called for the answer solus spiritus, and in particular, Luther probably wouldn't want to go there because one of the extremes that reforms, reformers had to deal with 
were the so-called enthusiasts who did hold to solus spiritus, although they didn't call it that. But I think that was Luther's concern. That, that, and then Calvin is very clear that we should never separate word and spirit. So on the other hand, sola scriptura, is that, does that mean separating word and spirit? I don't think it does because it's directed against tradition. It's not meant to be an insult to the third person. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Nick. Um, how do we think about in, uh, interpretation and certainty with respect to the gospel? So we're not uncertain about the gospel in a sense, but how do we relate that to our reading of the scriptures? Certainty is a, a tricky epi uh, epistemic category because there's subjective certainty and then there's objective certainty. And I guess the question is, how do we relate faith to certainty? Is it subjective certainty? Is it objective certainty? Um, if it were objective certainty, it's hard to see how it would still be what the Bible is talking about as faith because there's a contrast between what we believe through faith and what we see. Um, on the other hand, when Calvin talks about it, it has to do with the personal conviction. This is God's word. This word is indeed true. We can't perhaps prove its truth, but the, the, the spirit seals it in our heart. So I think properly to do justice to your question, we'd have to get into pneumatology and talk about this, what the sealing of the spirit means. But whatever, whatever answer we come to, I don't think it's something we can use, for example, in a, an apologetic setting. Um, so uh, we can be certain, and we have certain promises, but it's not the kind of certainty that translates into a certain argument that will necessarily convince others. But I think, I think that's what the sealing of the spirit is, so that we aren't plagued by doubt and anxiety. It's, it's the peace of God in our understanding. Yes, Mark. What is the place of allegorizing text today in the Reformed tradition? I feel like this is one of those questions where I want to ask you a question. <laughs> I think you're, you're I, are you trying to trick me? Uh, get me in trouble with someone. Just, is there a discussion happening that I don't know about? Uh, well, no, it's a serious question because, um, you know, I'm interested in this movement called theological interpretation of scripture and, and, you know, what is allegorizing and so on. I certainly wouldn't want to buy into allegorizing as a scheme that makes the Bible say, or sorry, that makes the Bible mean other than alos, what it says. Certainly don't want to go there. Uh, obviously, we have the famous example of Paul using the Abraham, Sarah, Hagar analogy or calling it something like that, but uh, he flagged it. I think it's important that he flags it as such. Um, I think what we, what we probably, so where I do want to resonate with you is I, I want to read scripture theologically. I don't want to simply read it as if it were a history book um, because there is a mystery in these histories. You know, 1 Corinthians 10, you know, suggests that the rock that was following Israel was Christ. Is that allegorizing or what? But I want to affirm it because Paul says it and uh, I want to get to, I guess I would see it in terms of uncovering God's intention in the text that may not become clear unless we read it in canonical context. Uh, so there's a control. The canonical context for me has to be the control. Nothing outside the text, the way the medieval allegorists seem to bring a, like a, a platonic system and, and find it in scripture. Uh, the canonical context has to govern it, but I do think we need to go beyond the original historical sense of the, of the human author because it also has a divine author. I'm just not sure I would call it allegorical. I would want to say I would want to read for the divinely intended sense. 
back row, uh, Greg. I hope you'll excuse my fat preamble. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I come from a place where I think there's more cultural diversity than anywhere else on the planet, mm. namely the Northern Territory. And my question is about philology and interpretive communities. Uh, should I pay attention to the way Aboriginal people understand the scriptures, even though they have very little philological knowledge? That was a nice, sharp, concise question. Thank you. Um, if, if they're believers, if it's a community of believers that we're talking about, I would want to be open to the possibility that their unique situation or their cultural situation might give them insights into certain aspects of scripture that others of us in a rich, capitalized society might not see. I'm open, I want to be open to that possibility. I'm not sure I want to give them a special privilege because of who they are, and I'm not sure that I want to give them a pass and say, well, you can read that way because that's where you are. I want them to read and bring them into the larger discussion of the Catholic Church down through the centuries. I'd want to hear their voice. I'm interested now. You've, got, you've piqued my interest. What, are, what do they say? Uh, but, you know, in a sense, you're asking a question that's very like uh, you know, what we're having now, discussion about African Christology. I mean, it's not as big a group as Africa, but in principle, it's the same phenomenon. And I find myself responding or wanting to react the same way. I want to be in that conversation, and I want to, I want to share with them what I think the West has learned. I don't want to lord it over them. I think all I can say is we've been listening longer than you have. But, and so, but I want to share, but I also want to hear back. Uh, the point about philology, though, is tricky because I don't, if they don't know philology, how are they reading? I, I guess that interests me as well. What, how do they read a text? And I want, to share, I want to share not only my insight into the text, but I want to share something about how I read it, and I would want to hear from them as well. So you've piqued my interest. <laughs> Peter, yes, in the back row. Thank you. Uh, uh, my question is about fiduciary uh, frameworks. And I'm just wondering, with the, the ten, uh, there seems to be a tendency amongst human beings to always think institutionally. So when you mention church, we think of an institution of church or tradition. <laughs> or tradition, you know, it's a long-standing thing. It always seems to tend towards the, the super-personal. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a fiduciary a framework in this discussion that, that comes to us through grassroots interpersonal relations? I'm just thinking like, you know, I believe because my dad told me to believe. Mm -hmm. I become a Christian because my friend who I trust and love mm -hmm. and who trusts and loves me mm -hmm. told me the gospel. And that yeah. um, so, yes, I, I think the fiduciary framework works best when we're unpacking how, we're, how we learn socially from others. And usually it's done in the context of, a, of, a, of an institution, a society, but any, any cultural configuration would be fine. And so I'm just thinking when you were talking, I think when my children were growing up, my family had a fiduciary framework and uh, they shared that and it was an important one. So I think the term itself is flexible I, and I, do, I guess I do need to soften it and just clarify, it doesn't necessarily have to be connected to an official institution. Uh, there can be, I suppose, I think culture, culture is an informal fiduciary framework. Uh, maybe you'd call it society. But yeah, there are lots of ways that we learn from others. And oftentimes in culture, we just soak it in and we, you know, it's just the way it is. We don't even think we're learning, but we're learning because we're immersed in this framework. And I, I do think it's helpful for Christians just to be aware that there are frameworks that condition our understanding. And we need to make sure that the one that we're tuned into the most is a canonical framework and not a, a cultural framework. But yeah, they can be of different sizes, I think.
I think we have time for one more question, possibly in the yes-no variety. Here's one. Oh. Dan. I just thought your answer then was particularly interesting because some of the fiduciary frameworks that we're involved in do seem to exercise a lot of power over us, like a family or something. You've given us a kind of ranking here of primary, secondary and tertiary. How does it actually play itself out in, in our experience? Um, how do we make the scripture a kind of primary fiduciary framework for ourselves? Uh, so I, I did rank them, and I was hoping that both church and church tradition would be ways that contribute to our making uh, scripture the primary one rather than rivals. But the, the main way I think we do it is we, we soak ourselves in it. You know, we have to immerse ourselves. It, Polani uses the word indwell. That's a very, it's a very biblical word. And I do think there's a sense in which we need to indwell the scriptures. We need to learn to interpret all of our experience through a biblical lens. And that takes time. You, that does, you, know, you can't just read it once and sort of cogitate about it. It has to really soak in. It has to be, you have to get to the point where you really do view your own life as caught up in this great thing God is doing in the world. And that you, it's, it's hard as an individual to do that. That's why we need the church, a supportive community. Oh, so you see it this way too. So I didn't mean them to be rivals. Uh, and I think an individual can make a lot of progress on his or her own, as Luther did by soaking it up. But yes, it's a, it's a, I think it's one of these things where we would all have to say always reforming, always you know, getting deeper into our fiduciary framework. Well, we've had uh, another rich exposition uh, of a soul of this morning. Uh, the richness of faith alone. Please join me in thanking uh, Professor Van Hoover.